Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motors Studio, here's Steve Jones. All right, uh, today's show brought to you by Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Key Routes 11 and 15, almost wharf online. SunburyMotors.com. Ford, Kia, Hyundai, great new inventory. Pre-owned inventory may be the way to go, whether it's the budget or maybe in some cases availability. It is all at Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Key Routes 11 and 15, Hummel's Wharf, and online at sunburymotors.com. Time now for our play-by-play call of the day. This dramatic moment last night in the Chiefs-Giants game. 34-yard attempt at a minute 12 to go. The kick by Butker is up, and the kick is inside the far upright and good. The Chiefs have a 20-17 to lead at 1.07 to go in the game. I think the play-by-play call reflects the game. Yep, he made it. <laughs> very, very true. I mean, that game was dull. And again, you know what Daniel Jones' record is in primetime games? I'm guessing he's got a goose egg. He's 0-7. There you go. He's like Kirk Cousins Jr., like, you know, I mean, I know he's a kid. I mean, I got it. He's, he hasn't been around that long, but still. And he doesn't have a lot around him to work with. But part of it is him, too. I mean, you look at the last drive last night. Oh, yeah, we'll throw it short here. We'll throw it inside. you got to be able to just step up and make some plays, man. He doesn't step up and make plays. He still plays it like it's, it's the middle of the third quarter. He can't play like that. You can't play like you can't play like it's the middle of the third quarter. See, I completed one. No, make some plays. All right. So uh, we will uh, now move to recruiting. Now I don't completely agree, by the way, with with Kirby Smart, because once you get the players, you then have to develop them. I mean, you have to make sure a five-star stays on the path of being a five-star. You have to have the ability to take a four-star, and if you develop him right, you can turn that four-star into a five-star player. You can take a three-star and turn them into a into a four-star. Now look at the development of Jahan Dotson. I mean, Dotson's now a five-star player. I mean, he wasn't a five-star player when he got here. So, I mean, development is a key part, but it's the foundation you start with that makes a big difference. I mean, it's very hard to take a two-star and make him a five. So with that, we bring in Ryan Snyder from On3.com. Sir, welcome. Great to have you with us. On3, man. That's, uh, that's the first time I've heard someone introduce me like that. It's pretty cool. But this, is, this has been, uh, man, this has been in the works for it feels like a year now. Um, so this is this is everything for us, man. This is, if you, if you guys have followed Blue White Illustrated, we've made some crazy changes over the last, five six months and it was all about yesterday's move uh it's on three so encourage fans to check it out uh it's a dollar subscription right now uh the the, the reaction we've got has been incredible um but uh hey let's let's talk some recruiting let's let's fill fans in on what it's all about yeah let's let's get to that because after the um after the um georgia florida game uh Kirby Smart was asked about recruiting. And when he talked about it, he talked about how all-encompassing there is. And Smart said, quote, there's no coach out there that can out-coach recruiting. I don't care who you are. The best coach to ever play the game better be a good recruiter. And, of course, a lot of Florida fans took umbrage to that. Another, and he talked about how you know how they make a lot of sacrifices family wise because they're always on the road. You have a lot of experience in this area, Ryan. So is that your experience? What he said? Well, 
let's put it this way. I'm looking at our own three team rankings right now. Okay? Here, here are your top five teams. Alabama, number one. Georgia, number two. Ohio State, number three. Clemson, number four. Oklahoma, number five. And then the Nittany Lions are number six. So uh, anybody who pays attention to college football will tell you that those top five teams have been pretty much the five dominating the sport for at least the playoff era and, you know, for, for Alabama and Ohio State a little longer than that. So I, I think that kind of speaks to itself right there on, on just how important recruiting is. Uh, there, there are coaches out there who move up uh, and, and through the ladder because they are excellent coaches, right? You know, we, we see mid-major coaches, you know, the, the MAC coaches move up eventually and, and, and they, they prove their self because, uh, you know, they, they have success at that level and, and they, they get to where they go. I mean, James Franklin, for example, has, has climbed the ladder as much or, or, and, and better as, as anyone out there. But when you get to the very top of, of this ladder, uh, it, it's all about the players, right? I mean, there, there's a reason that there are five-star players and four-star players, and there's a reason those guys stand out. So what, while coaching can, can often be the difference between, you know, sometimes maybe, um, you know, not, I don't want to say advancing the playoffs because I think players get you to the playoffs. Maybe, maybe co- coaching is kind of how, how you win sometimes when, when you're competing at that level and everybody's, you know, just just incredibly talented as it is. It, it's it's really the players that that put you in that position in the first place. So I would absolutely agree with that. You know, I, I'm a I'm a recruiting guru through and through. Uh, anyone who's followed me for a decade kind of kind of knows that by now. But yeah, man, and th- this is what it's all about, right? You, you have those talented players, those elite quarterbacks, those 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 defensive tackles. Uh, you know, who make a difference, and, and just you know, you can go through every position, but you know, the couple key positions where where it really stands out. And that's why those teams are dominating, and that's why they have been dominating for a long time. Penn State is right there, I feel like, on the bubble. Man, they, they, sometimes it felt like they're going to get over it. Sometimes it feels like they're dropping a little bit below. But to me, they're, they're right there on the line. They've been on that line for a long time. And um, personally, that's, that's why I think you need James Franklin here for a long time because he's right there. And right, with, that, exactly. with, that, with, that, with that playoff about to expand, uh, to, to me, you, you don't want to do anything to disrupt that. Exactly, because what spurred the question to Kirby Smart was the answer that Dan Mullen gave. Mm-hmm. We're in season right now, Mullen said. We'll do recruiting after the season, and when it gets to recruiting time, we could talk about recruiting. He didn't want to answer the question. And what Kirby Smart says is, look, we have to make sacrifices all the time with our families to do this, but we have to do this all year. And then essentially, James does that. He is out there by weeks when he could be, you know, I mean, he's, you know, his family has made sacrifices to make this happen. Mm-hmm. James Franklin has, I don't even want to call it, a, it, it's not a day off. James Franklin has one semi night off on Thursdays when he gets a couple hours with his family. Yeah. Oh, and, and by the way, that night is usually when he does a ton of Zoom calls with, with top recruits as That's well. Right. And he, you know, he does it from home. So, yeah, there, there's no denying uh, the commitment that it takes. Um, it, before every, just just before Friday night, for example, a big away game. You know, he's out at uh, he's out at watch Caden Saunders' game. He, he, he's on the road every Friday, out there trying to recruit and get his program better. And you know that that's that's all you can ever ask for. As far as Mullen, it, he, there's a reason why he didn't want to answer the question because he knew where it was going. And right. you know, all these coaches, they know how to talk. Uh, Florida's Florida's having one of its worst classes in a while. It, it's still ranked 17th in the country right now, uh, but they have a couple guys decommitting recently. They're, they're, they've missed out on a bunch of top prospects they were expected to get. So that, that's that's why he said that. Uh, he, I think in retrospect he would have worded it better because it, it you know it came off poorly to the fan base. But the, the reason he went around that that question was simply because he knew where it was leading and right. it was leading to people calling him out for having a poor recruiting class so hey man what one man's uh one man's mistake is, a, is another man's gain i guess with with kirby and ball in there and uh kirby's coming out on top again no doubt and yeah, no doubt about that all right so uh for penn state as you go through the season they already have a lot of verbals in this particular class everybody holding solid yeah for the most part you know there's a handful of guys down south uh that it, honestly, it, I, I, I can sit here and BS, but it's more so they just don't talk, <laughs> so it makes it hard to, right. to get a read on, you know. So I, I don't want to 
I don't want to sit to sit here and say, yeah, you know, I talk to every single one of these guys all the time, and uh, all I hear is positive things because there are a few, you know, like Cam Miller, for example, in Florida. I, I don't know if he's ever done an interview with any of us from Penn State. Uh, Andre Roy, now he's he's from Baltimore. He's not one of the Southern guys, but you know, he's another guy who just doesn't talk. So there are a handful of guys who just don't open up, and that's fine. You know, and not everybody is is into doing interviews and, and having people bug them all the time. And I have no issue with that, of course. Uh, but I will say that the majority of this class, right, the, the core of this class, the Bo Pribulas, the Drew Alars, the Caden Saunders, the Nick Singletons, and those are the guys that, you know, obviously I have a good relationship with and, and you know, so do some of my colleagues who cover it. Mm-hmm. And, and we are in touch, I would say, maybe twice a week or so. And, and there's no reason to think right now that, uh, any rumors or something like that would disrupt this class, especially not losses either. Uh, now, I, I would be um, uh, lying, I guess I'd say, if, if people aren't curious to see what would happen with James long term and and that how that situation plays out. You know, I've talked to parents about it, and usually they're just asking me if I know something that they don't, which is silly because they have access to James uh, uh, much more than I do, at least. But uh, there's nothing right now that makes me think we're going to start seeing a, a guy or two leave in the near future. Uh, Jordan Allen, of course, uh, he, he, he decommitted recently, and that was nothing to do with Franklin. It was really because he wanted to take more visits and didn't didn't really tell the staff about it. Right. He that was, his kind of was a communication it. issue. There's no getting exactly. around it. Yeah, and, and I will say that Jordan was kind of given a second opportunity, too, to not take that visit, and then he kind of, from what I understand, kind of told the staff he wasn't going to and then did it anyway. And, you know, when when you make one mistake and then you, you're given a chance to not do it uh, and then you just decide to do it anyway, that's kind of where Penn State said, okay, we, we can move on here. But the, 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 the core of this class, though, is as firm as, I think any Penn State fan could ask for with, with all the talk of Franklin and whatnot. Uh, and that's, that's because they're incredible uh, young men. I mean, they, Penn State goes after guys who, uh, like I say all the time, man, a lot of them are more mature than me, and uh, I, I give them a lot of credit for that. All right. Uh, now, what are the, in your opinion, the prime targets to finish? Mm-hmm. So w- with, with the Jordan Allen scholarship opening up, I've had a lot of people ask me about that. And, and the best thing I can say right now is that it really doesn't change much as far as uh, adding to the current class. And a big reason why, of course, is the transfer portal, uh, I think, as the season goes along. And this, this isn't really a Penn State thing. This is for every school. You, you start to find holes, right? Uh, you get four or five games in, six, seven games in. You start to find holes uh, that you think could maybe be plugged better with a transfer. And that's kind of the vibe I get right now uh, in regards to how they would use uh, that, that Jordan Allen uh, scholarship. So right now I, I kind of feel like we're still sitting in a spot where Penn State would like to add one maybe two more guys max uh linebacker jay sean barham out of st francis anyone who follows recruiting uh, should know jay sean's name pretty well by now we talk about him all the time he, he he remains that guy to really focus on we were watching for maybe a commitment uh in, in late october and nothing came out of that which wasn't a surprise that was more so uh rumors i guess than, than jay sean really saying that uh but but south carolina Florida, they, they kind of seem like the schools there, or Maryland too, of course. I, I would actually say Maryland's probably a state top competitor there, and he's just another guy who's incredibly quiet, so I can sit here and pretend I really know what he's thinking, uh, but that wouldn't be completely true, because he, he doesn't open up a ton. So, we're relying kind of secondhand on coaches and, and you know, Penn State sources on that one, and, and from the vibe we get, it's, it's that Maryland and Penn State are the top two schools. So, I, I think he is, you know, target numero uno, and if they get him, they could be very well be done with the class. Now, there are other guys. Larry Turner Gooden's a top prospect out of California who took an official visit. Uh, O-lineman Emil Wagner out of Ohio is getting closer to a decision. He's about to announce, I believe, in a week or two, although his brother is a graduate assistant now at Kentucky, and there's some ties there, which makes me think that's where he's going to end up. So there are going to be other guys who emerge. I'm sure somebody will pop up late in the cycle, maybe even after the signing period. But this class is pretty much done, and, and, and it's a great class. Like I said, it's number six in the country, according to our own three rankings. And um, you know, that's given the staff an opportunity to focus on 2023, which is always important. Right, which is going to be my next question anyway. So you anticipated it well. <laughs> uh, because they have li- – I really feel like they've laid an incredible foundation on 23. Is that the way your uh, feeling is, too? Absolutely, yeah, and they have to because the, the region as a whole for 2023 is down. 
So don't get me wrong. There's plenty of talent for a school like Penn State to have a lot of success in the Mid-Atlantic region, and they will. They, they always do. But I have no doubts about that. But the, the wide net uh, that you have to throw this year is, is a lot more down south and, and even in the Midwest, even a couple guys out west like Jaden Rashad is a top quarterback prospect we're watching. But, you know, whenever you have Alex Birchmeyer, Matthias Barnwell, uh, Joey Schlafler, and, and Lamont Payne, all three or all four of whom are four-star guys by at least one or two of these sites, and, and, and you know, most of them I, I think will be four-stars uh, pretty much everywhere by the time it's all said and done. Uh, th- that's an, an excellent start. I mean, we're, we we haven't even signed a 2022 class yet, and you have uh, you know four four star players lined up. But one guy I will mention here is uh, Josh Miller. He's a top offensive line prospect who we were watching potentially for a commitment today. He ended up putting on a top five just a little bit ago, and uh, the vibe I get there is that this is Penn State's to lose. Uh, I, I thought he was going to commit today. I, I talked about that on our podcast a little bit. And up until pretty much Saturday night, Sunday morning, maybe excuse me, more so Sunday uh, night, uh, Monday morning, that, that was the plan. He, he decided to hold off, which is fine. You know, he, he has about 13 months or so to go. Uh, so probably he made the right decision. But this is absolutely trending towards Penn State. Penn State and Clemson have been the top schools for a while now. I believe he included uh, Virginia Tech, Tennessee, and uh, one other school in there, I forget. Oh, North Carolina. Um, but but this is this is Penn State and Clemson at the top with everybody else in the mix. And I wouldn't be completely surprised if he has a decision here sooner than later. Okay, uh, Michigan will be coming up in a week, um, and that means, of course, visits. Are you getting an initial read on what the visit list could be mm-hmm. for a game like that? Well, we need a kickoff time. That would help a lot. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean yeah. I'm serious. It's not the Manhattan Project. Pick one. Move. <laughs> I mean, my goodness. You know, it's, come on. I have a few friends in the industry, and I'll say this. Uh, we know Disney has the right to – well, I'm not saying – we know Disney has the first two picks. They get the, the first two picks of the weekend. Yeah. yeah, so it'll end up being – basically what they're deciding between is do they want to put – Ohio State and Purdue at 3:30, or do they want to put Penn State and Michigan at 3:30? There, or or you know that they're kind of deciding between those two games and which order they want to put them. So we will find out Sunday, I guess. And and unfortunately, it it does have a major impact on Penn State's ability to put this list together ahead of time. Now they have probably you know 20, 30 guys lined up who will be here, and I would expect it to be many of the same guys we've been talking about for a long time yeah. now. You know, the Rodney Gallagher's, uh, you know, a lot of the committed guys, you know, just think of the top prospects within the region. They, they will mostly all be here. The issue, of course, with kickoff times is then trying to get somebody like a Grant Tucker or a Christian Hamilton who are down in North Carolina uh, to, to make a to make a long distance trip for this. Uh, especially if it's a noon kick and you know for a noon kick of course they want guys here at 10 a.m or so so they can see the team arrival and all the good stuff that comes with that so that that's the big that's the big issue right now i know uh some people in lash were really hoping for a kickoff time so they could really chip away at that list but i I will say this you know for auburn we saw 50 uncommitted players here which was an incredible list something i've really never seen before and when you add in a pandemic and you know, two plus years of not being able to show kids the whiteout, it all makes sense, right? That that that, that was sure. always going to be a huge list. Indiana was around 20 uncommitted players, which was another great list, another night game, stripe out, all that stuff. Uh, I, I would expect, if especially if this game is a 3:30 kick, I would expect you know 20, maybe even up to like 30 or so uncommitted players, which would be an excellent list. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. telling you right now, <laughs> Rutgers, Maryland, a lot of schools in the surrounding area would die to have a list like that. Uh, for, for a 3:30 kickoff, so that's kind of where we're aiming right now. Uh, but it's just so hard to put a put a put a list together right now when you also add in uh, playoff games and so many guys don't know right. if they'll be playing next next Friday night and right. all the issues that go on with that. So we see that every November uh, with with the late kickoff times and playoff games. So lots up in the air, but it'll be you know like I said, if 20 uncommitted guys aren't there, I'd be shocked. One final question, you know, uh, we we know about the quarterbacks, we know about the running backs. Yeah, we also know that these are all verbals. So, how much are other programs attempting to crowbar some people away? Yeah, well, we were talking about Florida earlier. Uh, they are chipping away at Cam Miller. He's the cornerback prospect uh, from down in Jacksonville. There, we'll see what comes with that. Uh, I've been trying to monitor it. Like I said, Cam is not one to talk too much. But uh, when it comes to Drew Allard, Nick Singleton, Caden Saunders, those those really important guys up there at the top. 
uh, that Penn State is holding firm, and, and, and really most schools have just said, okay, you know, we understand. Uh, you know, the, you guys have been committed for a long time now, and, you know, just bugging and bugging and bugging a player, uh, especially when they're into their senior years and they've been through this for two-plus years, uh, it's not really going to help you all that much. So, for the most part, I, I don't see much there. You know, of course, everybody likes to talk about Ohio State and Drew Allar. And, uh, I'll say this. I mean, if Drew Allar ever had the opportunity to, to go visit Ohio State, it would have probably been this past weekend. And uh, he, he did not take them up on that offer. So, I, I don't see any reason for fans to, to really worry about other schools or losses or anything like that. It's really just all about, um, you know, James Franklin being locked up and here for a long term. And, you know, I still think that's going to be the, the case long term, but that's what everybody wants to know right now, and we'll, we'll find out soon enough. Sir, it's an absolute pleasure, as always. Do great work, and uh, great to have you on uh, On3.com. Awesome. Appreciate you, Steve. Let's catch up soon. Ryan Snyder, On3.com, Blue White Illustrated. Come back with more in a moment. Brought to you by Sunbury Motors on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Taking your calls at 800 795 9565. This is The Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motors studio, here's Steve Jones. Eagles make any trades? Well, apparently they were aggressively trying to move Fletcher Cox, according to Jeff McLean from the Philly Inquirer. But I guess that didn't happen. So they're going to stamp that with what they have? Seems to be the case. It's going to be a long holiday season for you. All right. So, um, <laughs> good. That's great. Oh, boy. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. There is there is a trade. Oh, good. Tom Pelissero, 19 minutes ago. Broncos are sending rookie cornerback Carrie Vincent Jr. to the Eagles for a 2022 sixth-round pick. It just beat the 4 p.m. buzzer. So, there you go. Who? Another young corner cornerback. I have no idea who his name is. <laughs> <laughs> but the Eagles made a trade. Just I don't know who the dude is. Do they know who he is? Um, hopefully, but that's a good question. It's a great question. Tonight is Mac night. Besides the World Series, of course. But you've got Mac football tonight. So there you go. Big night. Mac football. Let's see what that games do we have tonight. Let me just yeah, I think I'll stick with the World Series. I'm just telling you it exists. I mean, it's, you know, it doesn't take you long to just like sit there and go, nah, I don't want to watch it. Yeah, not you. Yeah. So here you are. Tonight you got Miami of Ohio. At Ohio University on ESPNU at seven thirty. Okay, Miami of Ohio's four and four. OU one and seven. Okay. Also tonight you've got Eastern Michigan at Toledo. Eastern Michigan five and three. Toledo four and four. It's on ESPNU. You also have. The other game tonight is Ball State. I saw this. Ball State was playing tonight. Oh, my almighty! What the heck does Ball State have? Because they're 4-4, four and four, I know that. Let's see. NHL. Yeah, Ball State's at Akron, which is 2-6. and six. That's on CBS Sports Net. Now, we'll mention here, because Matt's becoming addicted, so it's Eastern Michigan is a nine-point underdog. Miami of Ohio is a seven-point favorite, and Ball State's a 20-point favorite. I'm only saying that because I know that like, you're getting tempted to take the life savings and bet it on Mac football. Trust me, I would bet on the NFL preseason before I bet on Mac football. (laughs) 
Wow. <laughs> no offense. Uh, let's see. But Clay Helton, by the way, is going to be the new head coach at Georgia Southern. He's being fired by USC on September 13th. Of course, Chad Lunsford was fired by Georgia Southern on September 26th. So Helton's going there. All set. And the World Series is tonight. Uh, this is where baseball runs into a problem. Now, I understand that there are circumstances behind what we saw from... Uh, from what we saw with the Braves in Game 5. Because the Braves were going to pitch Charlie Morton, and, of course, he got hurt in Game 1. And remember, of course, too, Houston's also operating without Lance McCullers Jr. Okay? Um, but we're seeing now so many bullpen games in the, wor- in the world in the playoffs. And no offense, oh, it's, it's the smart way to go. What Ian Anderson, who by the way is, it, did you see Ian, Ian Anderson pitch at all this year? This kid's a terrific prospect. Yes, he is. He is a terrific prospect. So he's, so he goes five innings the other night. Was it game three? I think it was game three. Maybe it was game four because I didn't, you know. He goes game four. How many hits did he give up in the five innings? I think it was only a handful. It was none. Oh, yeah, that was the combined no-hitter the other night. Yeah, right? they finally gave up hitting the eighth. Yeah, yeah, through the eighth. Yeah, that's right. Okay, now I realize that he is not going to pitch a complete game. I got that because, I don't know, he was, I think he was at 70 pitches or something like that through five innings. I mean, so it wasn't exactly a, an efficient work of art. But... He'd gone five innings and hadn't given up a hit. Okay? And I'm looking around going, you know, now I had to read about this, obviously. So I had to read about it. So he goes five innings, he gives up no hits, he walked three, and he struck out four, and he hit a batter. Like I said, it wasn't a work of art. But you're telling me he can't go two more innings? What am I missing here? I never have really understood a combined no-hitter because if you're in that point, that means your starter started it. So let him keep going. Don't change it. Well, see, that's what gets me. Throw everything out the window. They can't hit him. this is where the analytics people like I'm not a, you know I'm not on board with several items and here's one here's the world of common sense oh, no, this is the third time around well guess what there isn't a single person walking to the plate swaggering to the plate they haven't been able to hit him who's walking up with confidence we got him we got him really There's a reason that you. There's a reason why you're rolling along. You're just on that night. You're just better. Now they won the game, so obviously the the moves that Brian Snicker made were fine. I got it. Um. But he's got a no hitter going. He's not going to throw a complete game no hitter. I got it. I got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. But this thing about, well, it's the third time through the order. Stop it. Stop it with the third time through the order. The first two times they couldn't hit him. What, suddenly out of nowhere they're mystically going to find the formula? No. I mean, that's what gets me about this. All right. Where you sit there and 
you hear stuff like this, and, and everybody has to take their logic of, well, you know, and it's and it's infallible. Uh, no, Blake Snell is a good example. Anderson's thrown 17 innings during the playoffs. Has a 1.59 ERA. Pretty good. Again, his command wasn't great. He had three walks, he hit one. Okay. They didn't want him to face the tough Houston lineup a third time. The tough Houston lineup couldn't touch him. Now, to the credit of the bullpen, he made the move pay off. I got it. But I'm sorry. I'm just, I sit here and I'm looking at this. And when I'm looking at stuff like this, I sit back and say, you know what? This is what's turning people off to baseball. Right? This guy is going along. He's throwing a no hitter. You got people hooked. I mean, he is not, I know, he is not going to throw a complete game. I got it. I do because he's thrown too many pitches. So I understand that part. But, you know, you're trying to draw fans in. I realize they're trying to win, but you just cannot continue to sit there. And to appease everybody by saying, see, I made moves. You made moves? You can't go in and say, well, it was the third time through the lineup, and everybody's supposed to sit there and go, oh, great. Guess what? I watched the first two times through the lineup, right? Exactly where is it, where, where did he foul up? Where? Crazy. I just, I, I know. You don't understand analytics. I understand analytics perfectly, okay? I got it. That is not an issue about me understanding analytics. It's always like, you don't understand analytics. Yes, I do. And that's the problem you have, is that I do understand it. And you know what I would say to them? You don't understand how to manage a game. Okay, but you have to have eyes. You need eyes. You, If you're sitting there and it's all, okay, I've got my chart and I'm all number-based, you have no feel. There's no feel for the game. Then, Okay, if you had no feel for the game, you shouldn't be managing or coaching it. you got to be able to make some moves along the way where you use a little intuition. Instead of, I'm going to get criticized in the press conference if I don't make this move. Who cares? You get criticized by everybody anyway. What does it matter? Just, it, it just is baffling. Ba- I mean, baffling. Nobody has any, nobody coaches or manages, not anyway, there are a whole bunch of guys that do. But they manage or coach a game, you're like, come on. Hey, we watched Kevin Cash last year. Kevin Cash, I mean, look, Blake Snell may have blown up in the seventh inning. I don't know. But, geez, all we know is the move he did make because analytics dictated he do it. Right? He lost. Well, it shouldn't have happened that way. Analytics said, no, it lost because he didn't have a feel for his guy. And his guy walked off the mound furious, and guess what? He ended up being a San Diego Padre. I mean, seriously. And, it's, and I think it's the constant parade of pitchers to the mound, constant parade of pitchers, is a turnoff to fans, I think. Oh, yeah, it, it totally it. That's another big issue of slowing the game down. It slows the game down, but at the same time, it's okay, who's in now? What? Who? Right? And, and it, I'll tell you right now, fans of home teams watching this, they get their starting pitcher on the mound. He's doing pretty well. Oh, boy, they're going to bring in. Because they've watched all season. They know that the guy they're bringing in actually has a chance of fouling up. It's, uh, you, can't keep, you can't keep making moves because of what you think is going to be said in the press conference. Uh, who cares? I mean that's I mean you, that you can't coach or manage that way. But I do this, I mean, you know, 
At least I can walk in there. I can tell them, well, the numbers said, da 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 da. Heck with what the numbers said. Just walk in there and say, you know what? He was pitching great. I thought it, you know, and he, he wasn't tired. So we put him back out there. Third time through the order, guess what? I watched the first two times through the order, and you know what? They were struggling with him. Well, guess what? I'm going to stick with the guy that's making them struggle until he stops struggling. And as soon as he gets in a little trouble, they make a move. The heck? Ah, and I and I'm somebody who loves baseball, but some of the you know, I'm watching how the postseason's been managed. Like you sit there and go, another move, another guy. Oh man! You know what? Have you ever been to MIT or Harvard? I have not. I have. You know how many baseball national championship banners each has? I don't know. None. Back with more in a moment here on News Radio 1070 WKOK. When it comes to car buying, there's the other guy's way, and then there's the SMC way. The other guys force you into a vehicle you really don't want. The Subway Motors way lets you take the time you need to browse, ask questions, and take the test drive and think on it. For over 100 years, the Merth family and all their employees have made your experience the most pleasant one you'll ever have. The other guys won't offer you the best price for your trade, no matter how much they say they will. The SMC way is their promise to provide you with the most money the market shows your vehicle's worth. The SMC way is to offer you all assets applicable factory rebates on new vehicles and generous discounts. Looking for a pre-owned vehicle? The SMC Way checks each vehicle in a 200-mile radius to determine the lowest price, then beat it. It's the lowest price promise, just part of the SMC Way. The choice is up to you. The other guy's way or the SMC Way? The SMC Way wins every time. Sunbury Motors Company in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza, Sunbury, and at sunburymotors.com. Selling more cars and satisfying more customers for over 100 years. I wanted to circle back to Christian, if that's okay. Um, we just haven't had a chance to talk much about him. Um, w- with him being potentially one snap away from getting in there last Saturday, what kind of an impression has he made on you and the coaching staff over the course of uh, this entire season behind the scenes? His mental preparation with Sean, I think, has is, is been really good, and it's grown, obviously, when you talk about you know a, a, a guy coming in from high school. So I think he is... Uh, really adjusted well to that and has grown in that area significantly. I do think the the scrimmages that he's been able to get, uh, him and Taekwon on Sundays, I think has been really valuable. He's got really good poise, got really good arm strength. You know, sometimes he tends to throw, you know, too much, you know, just, you know, with his arm and, and doesn't get his lower half incorporated in the throws. But he seems to have a pretty good understanding of where to go with the ball and why and protections, which is a big thing usually for high school guys at this level getting adjusted to. But I think his poise probably is the thing that stands out to me most. Talking about Christian Veyu. Hey, Christian didn't play at all last year, which means he didn't practice last year because of what happened with COVID. So when he came in early, it was a big plus for him to come in early last year and be in the spring. Kind of get back into the flow of football again. He had to do that first. I think as time goes, I mean, he's got good size. He's got a good arm. I really like Christian's arm. He's got a good arm, got good size, uh, and he needs to be typical of a young quarterback, more accurate with the ball. When he's accurate, he throws a really nice, catchable ball. Now, some guys throw a heavy ball. Christian does not throw a heavy ball. He throws a nice, catchable ball. It's just what he needs to work on would be accuracy, which then goes back to what James just talked about, that lower half. Accuracy comes from your footwork. right? So sometimes he'll he'll throw it, and there's a lot of arm in it. And that's what he needs to work on now is, to, is being consistent with having the lower body in sync with the upper body when he throws. And when he does, boy, he throws a nice ball and he is accurate with it. But he's now going to be more consistent with that. That's where he is. At least that's what I think of my observation. And he can, you know, and he can see over people. I mean, his size, he's got good size. 
Yeah, so he looks out the line of scrimmage, the whole deal. He, he's got a good view of, of what's going on up there. All right. I know Matt was all excited about Mac Nation tonight. Uh, another big day for Scotty Pippen. Complaining about the um, Michael Jordan uh, documentary, Last Dance. Upcoming memoir, Unguarded, Pippen discusses the documentary and why it rubbed him the wrong way. Final two episodes aired on May 17th. Similar to the previous eight, they glorify Michael Jordan while not giving nearly enough praise to me and my proud teammates. Michael deserved a large portion of the blame. The producers had granted him editorial control of the final product. The doc could not have been released otherwise. He was the leading man and director, except Michael was determined to prove to the current generation of fans that he was larger than life during his day and still larger than LeBron James, the player many considered to be his equal, if not superior. Even in the second episode, which focused for a while on my difficult upbringing and the unlikely path to the NBA, the narrative returned to MJ and his determination to win. I was nothing more than a prop. His best teammate of all time, he called me. He couldn't have been more condescending if he tried. Each episode was the same. Michael on the pedestal, his teammate secondary, smaller. The message no different from when he referred to us back then as his supporting cast. From one season to the next, we received little or no credit when we won, but the bulk of the criticism when we lost. Michael could shoot six for 24 from the field, commit five turnovers, and he was still in the minds of the adoring press and public, the airless Jordan. Now, here I was in my mid-50s, 17 years since my final game, watching us being demeaned one more time. Living through the, it the first time was insulting enough. To make things worse, Michael received $10 million for his role in the dock, while my teammates and I didn't get a dime. You know, the last time I heard anything like this was when Matt, Mark Lawrence, myself, the Chief, Greg Wetzel, we're all sitting around one day, and we saw the documentary Ward Ford, What Made Me Great. <laughs> and we all thought that we felt like just bit pieces in the suit's power play of love. Yeah, that's right. I thought Lawrence was particularly bitter. Exactly. As he should be. Joe McGranahan looked around and went, so what? <laughs> Who's this? Where's Ward 4? 